Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Atom Bomb Angel by Peter James. So as always, I'm going to go through and read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say Peter James, to me, he's mostly known for writing the Roy Grace series, uh, which is a crime series. This is the second book he ever did very early on. Uh, it's actually published... Duh, 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 duh. Uh, first published in 1982, this edition in 2014. Um, but I want you to bear in mind that it was published in 82 because that predates uh, Chernobyl. Um, and it's interesting because that makes it kind of a prescient read as well. Anyway, let's go through, check out the blurb. So, Dane reads. Atom Bomb Angel was originally published in 1982, I told you. Now reissued for the first time, it features a brand new foreword by the author. Terrorists are threatening to sabotage Britain's nuclear power plants. One nuclear explosive smuggled inside a reactor would turn the entire core into a massive atom bomb and bring death and disease to millions of people for centuries to come. Sir Isaac Coit, chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority and the man responsible for the running of all nuclear power stations in the UK, disappears without trace. Then MI5 intercept mysterious film footage of Coit that apparently shows him defecting to Russian terrorists. But all is not as it seems. Has Coit in fact been kidnapped? And what is the mysterious Operation Angel? Max Flynn is briefed to find out who the terrorists are and which power stations they will sabotage in a race against time to stop Britain being engulfed in a nuclear nightmare. So, first off, we're gonna check out some of the foreword because there's some really interesting stuff in this. As a huge Discworld fan, and uh, you know, Terry Pratchett is one of my writing gods, I uh, also recently read Pratchett's biography um, which covered this period in his life as well. But it's interesting to see um, Peter James and Terry Pratchett coming across each other like this. So he says, Through an odd quirk of fate, Terry Pratchett gave me some research help on this novel, or rather didn't. You will notice if you read the acknowledgements that one is to the Central Electricity Generating Board. Atomic energy and nuclear power stations are key components of the plot of Atom Bomb Angel and, in 1981, as part of my research, I made an appointment to visit the press officer of the Central Electricity Generating Board, a Mr Terry Pratchett, then a completely unknown fledgling writer himself. As I sat down and explained my story, and that I wanted to have access to a nuclear power station, he said to me very pragmatically, well, I cannot possibly give you any help. Look at it from my perspective. If I help you with this book, and then when it's published, it frightens people off nuclear power, then the whole industry could go into decline and I could find myself being made redundant. And he wasn't joking. It was a very short meeting. He gave me a CEGB brochure, which I gather he had written, which argued in favor of nuclear power stations by pointing out that in Victorian times, an average of one person per week died by drowning in a mill pond, whereas there'd been only one than Wow, this sentence needs fixing. Whereas there had been only one than death caused by the entire British nuclear power program since the opening of Calder Hall in 1956, the world's first nuclear power station. Uh, and this is quite interesting as well um, because of his approach to research. Atom Bomb Angel is a book that had a profound impact on the way I was to research my novels from then on. I needed some short scenes in Namibia, but I was short of money, so instead of going out there, I gleaned all my information from books, this was before the internet, and from talking to someone who had worked there. When Atom Bomb Angel was published, I was asked about my experiences in Namibia in one of my first newspaper interviews. With my face bright red, I fibbed and squirmed my way through the interview, mumbling about it being quite hot and had a lot of sand, and surprisingly lush in places. I vowed then and there that never again would I write about anywhere that I had not visited, nor anything that I had not in some way experienced, death accepted. I think that has helped the authenticity of my writing hugely, although it has also led to many moments of terror, perhaps the worst being when I was incarcerated in a coffin with the lid screwed down for 30 minutes during my research for my first Roy Grace novel, Dead Simple, and I'm very deeply claustrophobic. Well, you have to suffer for your art, Peter. We get this, which I thought was quite fun as uh, I've been getting into running. It says, at the last station was a poster. It depicted a group of people in their 70s in tracksuits running through a field. The caption beneath said, you're not getting older, you're getting better. And that's followed up with, getting better. I wondered at what? I was getting older for sure, a damn sight too fast for my liking, but I certainly wasn't getting any better at anything. And that was a pity, because right now I needed to be one whole lot better at a great many things if I was gonna stay in this strange, tough, twisted temptress of a game that fatalists call the luck of the draw, clergymen call the ways of the Lord, and biologists call life. We get a few of these little lines in it that kind of hint at that kind of casual 
racism and uh, sexism and homophobia that was sort of prevalent in the early 80s and indeed throughout most of civilization. Um, so he gets a phone call and we get, when the switchboard had first put him through, he came across in an extremely irritating way, as people who can't speak one's language often do. We get this line, which I think is very true. One can fake a lot of emotions, but fear is probably the hardest. We get a few spy tricks as well, so I quite like this. Uh, there's a meeting in the toilets. Um, he went over to the entrance door and jammed a silver coin underneath it to make a scraping noise if anyone should come in. Very clever. We also get a reference to some of the tests they've done on um, the like reactor cores to make sure that they'll be safe. And in one, they simulated a, a plane going into it at 600 miles an hour and it didn't even make a dent. So that's how secure these places are. Uh, here we actually have that, that paragraph where it talks about that. Uh, the containment wall around the reactor core is two meter thick reinforced concrete. It is dome shaped for maximum structural strength and it will withstand very great stress. In tests on this type of dome, a simulation of a fully laden jumbo jet crashing into it at 600 miles an hour was done and the aircraft lost the fight. It didn't even make a noticeable dent. And here we learn some of the benefits of um, running nuclear power plants as well. Um, so it goes, cobalt radiation treatment units have extended the useful lives of people throughout the world by an estimated 11 million years. Over the next 20 years, this could jump to over 50 million years. Without nuclear power stations providing cobalt as a waste byproduct, most of this cobalt treatment would not be possible as the cost of producing cobalt would be out of reach of even the richest hospitals. Radiation is also playing an important new role in sterilization. Peaches on the food shelves of South African supermarkets are being given small doses of gamma rays. These kill the bacteria and increase the shelf life of the peaches by 10 times. The World Health Organization estimates that 30% of all the food in the world is not eaten because it has gone off before it ever reaches the table. The life of milk can be prolonged by doses of radiation. Salmonella and chickens can be killed off without affecting the flavor. And these rays leave no toxic residue whatsoever. And this sounds like me, this guy's um, the spy, Max, Max Flynn. He's got to get up at 7 a.m. Um, having to be at work at 7am was not my idea of fun and after 17 days I still had not got used to it. I decided I probably wouldn't ever get used to it. My circadian cycle, as the 24 hour clock in one's body is called, is not geared to be in harmony with the gentle glow of dawn. It prefers to commence its daily cycle several hours after the sun has first appeared over the far horizon and it likes to be jolted into action by a succession of cups of thick black coffee delivered by a warm naked girl. Much to the chagrin of myself and my much abused innards, my current coffee mate wasn't into 6.15 a.m. deliveries. I'm like that, except I would prefer that they just brought me a can of Monster Zero Sugar. He says, uh, the security services always buy British cars. Anyone worried about being tailed by MI5 can relax if he sees foreign cars behind him. That's funny, but also I doubt that's true anymore because that seems like a really simple way of giving, yourself, giving the game away, you know? Okay, we get a few scenes like this one. I'm not gonna read this all out because it's also, it's sexy times are happening. Um, but we see what's going through the guy's mind and then suddenly we jump in the same paragraph to the girl's mind and she's working out her Christmas shopping list. Um, and it just bothers me. Uh, and then we then jump over to um, Max Flynn. Um, so we have three different points of view from one scene. And two of them are in the same room, fair enough. Well, I mean, not fair enough, because it still gives me the heebie-jeebies as a writer. But one of them is like in a different country. So why are we having three, their three points of view in the same scene? And so the guy that Max is tailing, um, he fears off his usual routine and he's pissed off because he was supposed to be having a, a sexy evening with his girlfriend. He says, stupid, miserable bastard. If he didn't one day swing from the gallows for what he was doing to my country, he was damn well gonna swing from his testicles for what he was doing to my sex life. So here we go, we get an update on the Home Secretary. Um, so what's new in British intelligence, I asked him. Arthur loved to gossip, but not that he ever gave away state secrets, but he did pass on little snippets of personal information about my superiors. One little goodie for you, said Arthur. The Home Secretary, you probably read that he's in hospital for a few days for medical tests. I nodded. Well, he's actually there because he's suffering from uh, damage to the rear quarters. He and some boyfriend got a bit carried away together. We get this little um, one-two, which I enjoyed as well. Uh, I think we're going to need one hell of a lot of luck in the next three weeks, I said. Do you, said Arthur, somewhat surprised. I didn't know you were a person who believed in leaving things to luck. It's certainly not the reputation you have. You're known by most people in intelligence as the digger because that's exactly what you've always done. You've kept on digging until you found something. That's the only way in our game. Five shears law of intelligence. Facts, facts, facts. We'd all be useless without them. Wotan, that's their big computer, would be 15 million quids worth of scrap ironmongery without facts. And facts aren't acquired by luck, at least in my view, not often. 
People can say they got a lucky break, but I always disagree. People say a golfer is lucky if he gets a hole in one. I don't agree with that at all. Heck, that's what the chap's trying to do. When he drives off, he aims at that pin. Even if he can't see it, he's still aiming for it. And every time he stands on a tee throughout his life, he aims for that pin. If he goes to his grave without ever getting that hole in one, in my view, he's been unlucky. If he succeeded in getting a hole in one, I wouldn't say he'd been lucky. I'd say he'd been successful. He'd done what he tried to do. Well, I'm going to need an awful lot of golf balls, Arthur. Uh, we get a few end bombs from, again, one of these characters. You've got to assume it's the character and not um, Peter James, who's who's the racist there. We get a guy called Ben Senong. Uh, his father worked in a, a power plant digging for, I think, uranium, and eventually got cancer and died. So uh, he was he's obviously not a happy bunny about that. Ben Senong was a scientist, and he understood science. He did not understand the world, and most of what he knew of the world he hated. He hated all the countries that used nuclear energy. He hated the people in those countries for the lights they left on, for their mindless television programs, for their space invader machines, for their ice crossing machines, for their neon lights and moving staircases and sunray lamps, for their electric toothbrushes and toy train sets, for everything that was useless and meaningless and guzzled the energy that had made nuclear power at all necessary, and made it necessary for his father to spend his life down in that mine, breathing in those particles of dust that had radon atoms clinging to them, which had gone down into his lungs and sat there and set to work beaming out destruction, killing good cells and making bad cells until the bad cells began to multiply on their own without any assistance and dreadfully, painfully started to kill the life that was his father and destroy forever the will to live that was his mother. Namibia had no nuclear power stations. The uranium that was mined here went mostly to Europe and North America. His father had never switched on a light that was fueled by the uranium he had dug from the ground. And we get a character, uh, well here we go, this, this as we all know is not how chloroform works but anyway. I uh, waited until he had put his hand on the handle of the Datsun's passenger door. Then I clamped the chloroform-soaked rag over his nose. The shock of it must have made him take a deeper breath than usual, for he went limp right away. And that's not how chloroform works. It takes like five minutes to take effect, which surprised me because, again, Peter James is normally pretty good with the amount of research he does. Oh, we learn where Angel comes from, anti-nuclear generated electricity. And again, the idea here is to, the terrorists are going to blow up the um, nuclear power plants. So here we uh, learn a little bit about what would happen if, it, um, if the containment did blow to pieces, the blast would almost certainly sever the coolant pipes. The result would be that the core would become so hot that it would start to melt into a solid lump and go on heating up. This is the worst nightmare of the nuclear energy industry. The Americans call it the China Syndrome because some believe if this happened, the core would start burning its way down through the center of the earth, down towards China, China being the other side of the globe from the United States. We would call it here the Australia Syndrome, I suppose. Of course, it would not actually get to Australia. It would come to a halt in the first water substrata layer. Not that that would stop the reaction. It would sit in the water for the best part of a couple of weeks before it burned itself out. Sending up steam, said Fifeshire. Yes, the steam would shoot straight up the funnel it had made, through the breach containment, and it would then spread out downwind. Highly radioactive. Highly. And what about this substrata water? Does man come into contact with it? Good Lord, yes, Sir Charles. Elementary geography. You must have learned it at school. Streams, rivers, lakes, rain, you name it. And it would be polluted. Couldn't touch it for centuries. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Let's not let that happen. So he just mentions he gets a gin and he mentions that tonic is called quinine in the States. Uh, I don't know if it still is, but that's one of the ingredients in it, which is probably why. And we get a reference to like a book cipher being used. He says, it was an old but very effective form of code, a book code. They would have a copy of the same novel in Hamburg. Unless anyone in intercepting the message knew what the book was, it was virtually impossible to crack the code on such a short message as this. Slater had evidently been reading his detective novels. So is Peter James. And he gets, uh, somebody puts a gun against his head. Uh, he gets, uh, da -da -da. well, let me just read this, read this out. During the three million, well, actually, I thought this whole bit was good. My train of thought was suddenly interrupted when my eyes told my brain that a shadow had all of a sudden fallen across the desk. And my brain figured out that since the chief source of light, the window, was behind the desk and my eyes could see nothing unusual in front of them, then the cause of the shadow must be behind me. During the three millionths of a second it took my brain to reach this not illogical conclusion, the nerve ends in my right temple informed my brain that a cold metal object had just been pressed against my right temple. The hammer, anvil and echo chamber within my ear holes on both sides of my head received a series of vibrations, which they passed on to my brain, and my brain decoded those vibrations into words from a human being, male, Caucasian, of strongly Germanic origins. Move and I'll shoot, were the words. A tidal wave of cold fear thundered through me and I felt that most of my innards had been flushed away. I froze for some moments, trying desperately to gather my wits and to remember what to do in situations like this. I remembered. 
Didn't anyone tell you it's rude to enter a room without knocking? I said. I wasn't absolutely sure, but I thought I could hear him thinking. I will ask the questions. And that just reminds me of the old joke. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Gestapo officer. Gestapo officer too. I will ask the questions. I went to bed and dreamed dreams of mockery and failure and death and woke in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, one of the great perks of my trade. Then I went back to sleep again, and this time the night was kinder to me. So he goes and gets a copy of uh, Fear of Flying, which is the book that's being used for this code. He says, uh, I had read it before and it didn't put me off air travel. It had about as much to do with flying as breakfast at Tiffany's had to do with eating. And we get this as well. Um, he goes to Toronto and out to the right, I can see bits of Toronto rising from the vast whiteness of snow. The CN Tower with its blinking lights build as the world's tallest freestanding structure. Uh, and obviously these days, the world's tallest freestanding structure, I assume is the Burj Khalifa. After I'd spoken to Five Show, I went to the Toronto branch of Thomas Cook and had a good look at aircraft schedules and railway timetables. And then there wasn't a great deal more I could do until the following morning. Oscar Wilde once described the Niagara Falls as a vast, unnecessary amount of water flowing the wrong way and falling over an unnecessary amount of rocks. Sooner or later, he said, every American groom takes every American bride to the Niagara Falls and there must surely be the second biggest disappointment in American married life. His observations did not deter 8 million tourists a year from making the pilgrimage down the Niagara Peninsula, where, incidentally, the grapes were some of the world's most revolting wine are grown to see for themselves, and I decided to do likewise. I stood in the teeming spray as the water slid gently over the lip, before thundering down into the foaming abyss with a demonstration of power it would be hard to rival, and I decided his estimation of the cunning of the Marquis of Queensbury wasn't the only thing poor Oscar had been wrong about. So he tries to um, steal a car we get. I tried to get my flat skeleton key into the door lock, but the lock was frozen solid. I lit my cigarette lighter and put the key over the flame for several seconds. It then slid easily into the lock and turned. Clever. Oh, and then um, the royal family is evacuated and this is kind of fun. Uh, behind the seats was a padded space which had been especially designed to accommodate a quantity of small dogs and it was currently occupied by several puzzled corgis. The six seats were also occupied by six no less puzzled adults. They were the Queen, Prince Philip, the Queen Mother, the Prince and Princess of Wales with their baby in a carry cot, and Prince Andrew. And I just think that it's kind of funny that it, it, it dates it specifically that, that because they only have the one baby, so it's between when William was born and Harry was born, so kind of cool. But yeah, Atom Bomb Angel by Peter James, actually a lot better than the other uh, Max Flynn book. I, I probably would give this a week four out of five. It was, it was a pretty good book, to be honest, especially considering how long ago it was written, how early on in his career it was. Um, and it just shows that, you know, that he had the talent early on. He's obviously a much better writer now, but yeah, pretty impressed with it. So there we have it. That's what I made of Atom Bomb Angel by Peter James. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.